for processing data compressed at the logical level, um, such as um, exploiting dictionary encoding or run links encoding for different operators. At the phys uh, level of physical compression, there have been proposed such operators like um, the uh, selection scans of SIMD scan, bit weaving, or byte slice. And um, the problem is nevertheless that these are only certain operators for certain formats, but there's no holistic approach that can support um, the compression of intermediate results in a systematic way. And this is exactly the gap that we try to close with our processing model. So our goals are as follows. Um, firstly, we want to support the compression of all intermediates so that we can um, exploit the potential of compression during the entire query processing from the base data um, until the final query results. Second, we want to be able to choose an individual format for each in, uh, intermediate result so that we can adapt to the individual data characteristics there. And interestingly, this also um, implies that we need the possibility to actually change the compressed representation during query execution. And thirdly, we want to avoid the um, uncompressed materialization of the entire inputs and outputs of an operator because this would always um, severely limit the benefits that we can um, achieve through compression. So as a foundation for our processing model, we decided to um, adopt and extend the um, column at a time model that was originally introduced by MoMeDB because um, it, it suits our needs of processing integer sequences very well. In that sense, in our case, um, the data, be it base data or intermediates, are always of columnar form, and we assume that all data are integer sequences, and um, that, um, for instance, some kind of dictionary encoding has been um, applied prior to query execution for string columns, for instance. Furthermore, we assume that each column is represented in one compressed format, um, but at this point I have to highlight that most lightweight integer compression algorithms um, already subdivide the data they are passed um, in an algorithm specific way, for instance, into blocks so that they can um, adapt to local variations in the data distributions. So we don't have to care for that from the outside. Um, our operators consume and produce columns and have been inspired by the MAL operators from MoneyDB. At the level of an entire web, a query execution plan, and we fully materialize all intermediate results using lightweight integer compression algorithms. So to give you a little overview of the operators that we consider so far, um, at the moment we support these 12 um, operators for columnar data. Of course, they are not enough to execute arbitrary analytical SQL statements, but at least they suffice to execute the well-known star schema benchmark. So to give you an example, um, the select operator um, takes a, an integer sequence um, as input and is parameterized with a lower and upper bound. And in its output, it stores the positions of matching data elements in the input column. Such a list of positions is again a sequence of integers. And it could, for instance, be used in the project operator to um, extract the corresponding data elements from another column of the same relation, which are then output by this operator. So now the question is, how can we integrate compression into such columnar operators for integer sequences? And for that purpose, we identified four degrees of integration, which result from two orthogonal dimensions. So first, um, we can distinguish um, the uh, internal processing inside the operator, which could happen either on uncompressed data or on compressed data. The second dimension is data access which could either happen directly in the format the data is materialized in or adaptively to um, change the compressed representation on the fly to, facil uh, to facilitate efficient processing. So now I would briefly summarize each of these degrees. And in that context, we always use gray to denote the uncompressed data and colors to denote compressed data in different formats. The first degree is purely uncompressed processing. It's of, it's of course uh, trivial. There's no compression and we only use it as a baseline. However, we can reuse that operator on uncompressed data by surrounding it with a wrapper that performs a temporary decompression of the inputs and recompression of the outputs. That's why we call this degree on the fly de recompression. Um, this degree has a minimal integration effort because it only depends 
on an existing operator implementation and existing implementations of compression and decompression algorithms. But nevertheless, it already suffices to achieve all our three goals that I've just mentioned. And the main advantage here is that it can increase the effective memory bandwidth. Um, interesting, interestingly, um, your group has um, proposed um, a related approach several years ago that was uh, RAM CPU cache compression. Um, but on, in fact, um, on the flight here, recompression goes beyond that by also recompressing the outputs so that we can exploit compression also for the intermediate results. Um, but the problem of this approach is still that um, it processes uncompressed data internally and thus uh, wastes the potential of um, processing compressed data directly. At this point, specialized operators enter the stage. These operators are tailored to a very specific combination of input and output formats and also serves as a home for um, operators from the literature, for instance, between beam or byte slice. Besides the um, improved effective memory bandwidth, this degree also increases the data level parallelism by working directly on compressed data and um, um, especially in context uh, in combination with SIMD instructions. But as a downside, here we are restricted to certain formats for the intermediate results, which might not be desirable, desirable in all cases. That's why the final degree is on the fly morphing. Here, the, um, uh, the input and output data are temporarily um, transformed from one compressed representation to another compressed representation. Specifically for this purpose, we have um, proposed and introduced so-called direct integer morphing algorithms, um, which are a topic um, of their own, but due to time limitations, I will not go into details of these algorithms in my talk right here. So with this degree, um, we can gain back the flexibility when selecting the formats, but this comes at the cost of um, a certain morphing overhead in the wrapper. So while each of these degrees of integration might have its individual advantages and disadvantages, um, and our work will mainly focus on on-the-fly DN recompression because um, of its simplicity and because of the fact that it can already achieve all our three goals. Nevertheless, on-the-fly DN recompression only works well if it's implemented really efficiently. And that's why I would like to show you how we accomplished this. So, um, don't be shocked by this um, diagram here. I will briefly brief, uh, I will walk you through um, all the individual steps here. So first of all, um, an operator is subdivided into three layers, namely the column layer, the buffer layer, and the vector register layer. Each of these layers is responsible for, com uh, for processing the data at a um, respective level of granularity. So um, first, um, the column layer separates an input column into its compressed main part and an uncompressed rest part, um, which could result from the fact that um, very small amounts of data elements are not um, compressible by all um, compression algorithms. This part is usually very small. Um, and, and it hands both of these parts to the input side buffer layer. In the first call to the input side um, buffer layer, um, basically, the decompression routine of the input format is executed, but instead of materializing the decompressed vectors, um, it directly hands them over to the vector register layer. Similarly, this in the second call to the input side buffer layer, um, the remaining um, uncompressed vectors are simply loaded from the um, uncompressed remainder of the input column and also pipelined through the vector register layer. In the vector register layer itself, um, the actual um, operations of the logical operator are performed. So for instance, if this is a, a selection operator, here we would perform a vectorized comparison um, of our data elements to the lower and upper bounds of our range predicate um, using SIMD instructions usually. So um, the result of this vector register layer is again a vector register, usually accompanied by a bit mask, um, which indicates which data elements are actually valid in the output. Now, it would be really cool if we could directly recompress this single vector, but this is um, unfortunately not possible in many cases um, for two reasons. Firstly, because many compression algorithms um, need to see um, a certain block of data elements to decide how to compress them. And secondly, because um, with selective operators, it's, it would be hard to continue the processing with an underutilized vector register. That's why we buffer 
the output data of the vector register in a cache resident uh, buffer in the output side uh, buffer layer. And only once this buffer is full, we um, trigger the recompression procedure, which um, directly stores its compressed output to the output color. Um, once all input data elements have been processed, we flush the remaining data elements um, uh, that still reside in the internal buffer to the uncompressed um, remainder of our output column and um, give it back to the main query program. Um, interestingly, we can um, implement this uh, procedure in a very economical way for different logical operators and different compressed input and output formats because in fact only the vector register layer depends on the logical operator and only the buffer layer depends on the input and output formats. That's why we implemented all these, um, uh, all these three different layers um, as separate components for the different logical operators and input and output formats and stitch them together using C++ template metaprogramming whereby we um, uh, force the compiler to inline the repeated calls to the vector register layer um, so that we can achieve maximum performance here. Performance is actually a good keyword. Let's have a look at some micro benchmarks. Let's again consider our select operator. Um, the results that I show you here have been uh, obtained on a not too old Intel Xeon processor using AVX 512. And for our example, let's consider just two different input columns for the select operator. The first column mostly contains of six bit values, but has a very low number of um, 63 bit outliers. So it is still well compressible. And the other column um, contains only random 63 bit values, so it's hard to compress. This diagram um, shows the runtime of the select operator at a selectivity of 1%. And here each dot represents one combination of input and output formats. So um, altogether we had five different formats for input and output here, one of which is the uncompressed format. And so we have 25 combinations in total. The red dot um, is the purely uncompressed processing. And we can see that the performance of this approach um, is the same irrespective of the input column and its data characteristics. What we can see, what we can also see here is that um, using on the fly DN recompression, we can accelerate the processing by up to 64% for our column one, if we choose an appropriate format combination. And nevertheless, the performance can also decrease by 68% uh, if we choose an unsuitable format combination. So we have to choose the formats really carefully. Regarding our hard to compress column number two, um, we, here we can achieve basically no performance improvements using on the fly DNG compression, yeah, because uh, the data is not well compressible. However, um, this picture changes completely if we increase the selectivity to 90%. What you can see here is that um, if we only compress the, um, if we don't compress the output of the operator, then we can achieve no or only very slight improvement compared to the uncompressed processing. And only if we also com uh, compress, uh, if we also compress the output of this operator, then we can achieve significant improvements of 80% or 76% um, for our two input columns. And this is especially crucial since the output of the select operator can only be an intermediate result in the context of a query execution plan. So um, this underlines that we should actually um, compress intermediate results in order to obtain maximum performance. Okay, um, that means that now we are able to process analytical queries with a continuous compression of intermediate results. And um, now the question is, how should we use this processing model effectively? Especially how should we, uh, how should we choose the formats of the intermediate results um, in a suitable way? And this brings us to our compression aware strategies for the query optimization. So there are different approaches for incorporating compression awareness into a query optimizer. The most involved uh, approach would be a deep integration. That means um, starting with an uh, initial query execution plan um, out by a parser, the query optimizer would consider different plan structures, different physical operators, different format um, combinations at the same time and to return the plan with a um, globally best cost. So in theory, um, this approach might find the globally optimal plan. 
However, um, we all know that it's not realistic to find a globally optimal plan um, due to several reasons. And in addition to that, this approach increase, uh, implies um, a large increase of the search space. That's why we decided to restrict ourselves a little bit to make it uh, somewhat easier. First, we decided to focus only on our novel on the fly DN recompression. Second, we decided to postpone all compression awareness to a secondary optimization phase. That means first we execute an existing query optimizer that decides the structure of the plan, um, considering a purely uncompressed processing. And then in a secondary optimization phase, we enhance this plan with compression information. So while we might fail to find a globally optimal plan here, we might still improve the performance um, of the purely uncompressed processing, which is already an achievement. And in addition to that, the integration is much simpler here and the search space increases much smaller. To come up with some strategies for secondary query optimization, we followed a two-step approach. First, we developed um, a cost model for lightweight integer compression algorithms and a selection strategy for such algorithms. And then we extended this cost model for um, secondary query optimization strategies at the level of an entire query execution plan. And in that context, we always consider two objectives, namely the memory footprint and the query runtime, both of which are really important in, data by, uh, in, in query optimization. So for our selection strategy for an integer compression algorithm, we consider that the input is a column. We have a couple of algorithms to choose from, and we would like to know which of them is the best one with respect to a certain objective. And now we develop a, this cost-based selection strategy, um, which does not um, consider the entire column as it is, but views it only as a set of minimal data characteristics. In general, this cost model adopts a gray box approach. Um, on one hand, we uh, model everything that's known from the algorithm's specification or our experimental surveys, such as the block sizes it uses, the bit with its supports, um, or the decisive data characteristics. And on the other hand, we measure everything that is related to the execution of the algorithm um, on the specific hardware, such as the clock frequency, the memory bandwidth, the cache sizes, or the cost of branch mispredictions. And these things are captured in a um, offline calibration phase that happens just once before we do any estimations. Now regarding the estimations um, for a single column, we differentiate um, for the different classes of algorithms. As I've already mentioned, um, there are logical level algorithms, physical level algorithms, and cascades of such algorithms. So let's start with the physical level algorithms. Here our experimental survey revealed that the most decisive data characteristic is the um, bit width of the data because we want to eliminate leading zero bits. And we capture the bit width in form of the bit width histogram of the data that reports the relative frequency of data elements having a certain bit width or requiring a certain bit width for lossless representation in our data set. Now, um, there are many, many different bit width histograms, of course. And so what should we use in the calibration phase? Which bit width histograms are actually, are actually relevant? Here we decided to go for the um, so-called one-hot uh, bit with histograms. That means histograms that um, contain or that report only um, one um, bit with in the data. So we generated data sets, for instance, that contain only one bit values and measured the behavior of the algorithm that we consider on this data set with respect to the objective um, that we currently consider, for instance, the compression rate or the um, compression runtime or decompression runtime and so on. And we repeat this for all possible bit widths, for instance, until 32 or 64. And that way we obtain what we call a bit width profile of the algorithm, which basically um, reflects the behavior of the algorithm subject to the bit width. And now the main idea of our estimation for physical level algorithms is to, um, to weigh the measurements in the bit width profile with the relative frequencies in any uh, bit with histogram. That means we basically calculate a dot product of these two vectors um, to obtain our estimate. However, 
um, this is just a simplification because we have to take uh, we have to take two additional effects into account. Firstly, uh, many night suppression algorithms cannot represent every data element with its individual bit width. But um, for instance, they use blocks in which um, all data elements are um, encoded with the same number of bits. And therefore, we have to adapt the bit width histogram to the algorithm's view on the data. And for doing so, we have developed formulae um, for different classes of night suppression algorithms. And the second effect, which only um, um, affects the runtime estimations, is that there are some night suppression algorithms which process um, data elements of different bit widths in different code branches. And these algorithms typically suffer from branch mispredictions. And that's why for some algorithms, we need a measure for the mixture of different bit widths. And um, we calculate this measure in an algorithm specific way and add it to the uh, runtime estimates to become more accurate. So that was the basic idea for physical level algorithms. For logical level algorithms, it's a little bit simpler and um, I wouldn't go into the details here even. Um, but what's more interesting actually is the cascades because there's a very high number of different cascades and we don't want to develop an individual model for each combination. But instead, we would like to reuse the estimates for the involved logical level algorithm and physical level algorithm. In particular, um, we use the estimate of the logical level algorithm on the given data characteristics and the estimate for the physical level algorithm on the data characteristics after the logical level algorithm. And to estimate these um, adapted data characteristics, we developed um, estimation formulas for all four logical level techniques. And now this combination of these estimates depends on the objective for the compression rate, which is um, yeah, expressed usually expressed as a, as a ratio of the compressed data size to the uncompressed data size. We can use multiplication. And for runtimes, we can use addition by assuming um, that the um, runtimes for these two components add up. They need to, need to be added up. So to sum up, um, our selection for an integer compression algorithm for a single column, we have seen that we have to extend the picture by the profiles for different algorithms, whereby we need a profile for each objective. And then we can calculate the costs of all available algorithms and return the algorithm with the minimal cost. So this works for a single column and can, for instance, be applied to select a suitable algorithm for the base data. But now, if we want to apply this to the intermediates in a query execution plan, um, we have to extend this cost model to secondary query optimization strategies. And now I want to present you what we've done in that direction. So first of all, we assume that we know the data characteristics of all intermediates results. Um, we might obtain them from an existing query optimizer, but this is an orthogonal topic um, that we didn't address in detail. So if you want to minimize the memory footprint of the query, which we define as the total physical size of all columns, or that means all base columns and all intermediates, we have to focus uh, on these columns, of course. And here it's pretty straightforward. We can treat each column individually. We can use our cost, uh, cost model for lightweight integer compression algorithms to estimate the physical sizes of each column in each format. And then for each column, we can select the format resulting in the lowest physical size. When we want to minimize query runtime, it's a little bit more involved because actually we are interested in the total sum of the, of the um, runtimes of all operators. Um, but this could be a little bit difficult because we have to estimate how long um, the processing takes. And um, here we decided to make a little simplification because we can observe that um, since we assume that the structure of the plan is fixed, the internal processing done by the operators is the same irrespective of the formats that we choose for the intermediate results. And that's why we decided only to estimate and model the time that is spent in the adaptive data access of on-the-fly DNA recompression. And this data, uh, adaptive data access consists of the runtimes of compression and decompression operations. At this point, it might be tempting to do this um, optimization for each operator in isolation, 
But then the problem is that um, different operators sharing one and the same intermediate might prefer different formats for that intermediate. So we could run into conflicts here. But luckily, um, we can again push this decision down to the level of the columns by observing that um, each column and its format incur a certain adaptive data access um, runtime in all operators that um, access this column. So we can again use our cost model um, for individual algorithms to estimate this um, yeah, sum of runtimes of compression and decompression operations for all readers and, and the single writer of this column, and then select for each column individually um, the most suitable format. Okay, so at this point, we are able to um, make effective use of our novel processing model for compressed intermediates. And now the final question is, does our vision actually work? Does it pay off? Can we increase or can we improve memory footprint and performance? And um, with that, we come to our end-to-end -end evaluation. So we implemented all um, the stuff that I have just presented to you in MorphStore. That's our research prototype of an analytical query engine for columnar data. MorphStore has two first-class citizens. On the one hand, that's vectorization, where we use SIMD extensions in a hardware oblivious way through our template vector library. In the following experiments, we focus on ABX 512. And the second first class citizen is compression, which is used in a way I outlined in this talk. And um, at the moment, we especially focus on on flight DNA recompression, and so far support five different formats, namely uncompressed data, then um, two uh, null suppression algorithms and two cascades um, of delta and null suppression and frame of reference and null suppression. The experiments I'm going to show you have been conducted again on a not too old in the Xeon processor um, on a Linux machine. And um, here we use the star schema benchmark at scale factor 10. We applied an order preserving dictionary encoding to all string columns prior to query execution and omitted the order by clause in all queries because MOSO does not support it yet. Furthermore, we always consider two evaluation metrics which correspond to the obje uh, optimization objectives, namely the memory footprint and the query runtime, whereby we only focus on the single threaded um, execution and we, we report only the query execution time, so no optimization or parsing or results output, and we report the mean of 10 repetitions um, of runtime measurements. Then the following, um, let's have a look at different aspects of our cost model and see how effective it is in the end. So first, let's assume that we use our continuous compression for all the columns in the query execution plan for base data and intermediate results. Here we consider four different format combinations. Um, we consider the purely uncompressed processing. We consider um, a, fixed, uh, a fixed length, null suppression. This is, this is the SIMDBP FL where all data elements in the column have the same bit width. And we consider the actual worst and best format combinations, which we determined in an, in an exhaustive way. So here are the results um, for the memory footprint. We can see that uncompressed processing is already the worst thing we can do here. But as soon as we use compression, the results get uh, much better. So in fact, on average of all SSB queries, we can reduce the memory footprint by about 70% if we use the best format combination. These are the results for the runtimes. Here we see that the worst combination is actually even worse than purely uncompressed processing. So it's really important that we um, make a good decision of the formats. And we see that the best combination yields a, a runtime improvement of 34% uh, uh, um, in average of all SSB queries. That means that our continuous compression using on-the-fly DNA recompression can, in fact, improve query processing with respect to both considered objectives. But now the question is, in how far does our proposed compression of intermediate results contribute to these improvements in comparison to the already well-established compression of base data? And that's what we investigate next. So here we start with a purely uncompressed processing, then we add compression for the base columns, and then we add compression for the intermediate results. So here are the measurements for the memory footprint. We can see that um, compression of the base columns already improves the memory footprint significantly. And for most queries, compressing the intermediates as well um, also 
makes a nice contribution here. These are the results for the runtimes. Uh, interestingly, we can see that compressing only base data um, yields only insignificant improvements for many queries. And even on average of all SSP queries, it um, accelerates the processing only by a couple of percent, while um, additionally compressing intermediates actually plays the larger role for most queries here. So that means that our idea of compressing intermediate results is really beneficial um, and really makes a, a large contribution for compressed query processing, both for the memory footprint and the total runtime of a query. So now let's have a look at our cost-based format selection strategy. Here we compare our cost-based format decision to the actual best format decision. And regarding the memory footprints, there's not much to say. As you can see, um, we achieve quasi-perfect results with our selection strategies here. For the runtimes, um, we are usually, um, or, or the format combinations that we determine in our cost-based way is usually a few percent worse than the actual best combination, but still the results are very good on average. So that means that our compression area strategies for secondary query optimization can make effective use of our processing model. And finally, we compared um, the AQ execution morpha to MoonyDB because it is the column store with the most similar processing model um, to ours in terms of the purely uncompressed processing. Um, however, to the best of our knowledge, MoonyDB does not use SIMD instructions and does not support the explicit compression of intermediate results. That's why for fair comparison, we start um, with morph store in the same setting. Then we add AVX512 vectorization in morph store, and finally we add the continuous compression of intermediate results using our on-the-fly DN recompression. So here are the runtime results. What we can see here is that for the sphere comparison, uh, in some cases MoneyDB is faster, in other cases uh, morph store is faster, faster, but on average um, both systems achieve about the same performance. Now, if we add um, vectorization to the execution morph store, we accelerate the query processing um, by about 20% on average. And if we further also add our continuous compression, we can again speed up the query processing by about one third, which is then um, about um, twice as fast as the uncompressed and scalar processing. Okay, so far for the end-to-end uh, -end evaluation. Um, that concludes my talk. So let me briefly summarize um, what I've just told you and what we contributed. Um, our vision is the analytical query processing based on the continuous compression of intermediates. We have um, conducted an extensive experimental evaluation of lightweight integer compression algorithms to gain deep insights into their behavior. We have proposed a novel processing model for compressed intermediates, which um, is based on four different degrees of integration, whereby we mainly focused on on-the-fly DN recompression. Um, we also propose direct integer morphing algorithms, which I've skipped in this talk, um, but which are also um, employed by our processing model, especially for the on-the-fly morphing approach. We developed a novel cost model for lightweight integer compression algorithms, which can not only be used for the base data, but also for intermediate results. Based on that, we developed compression-aware strategies for secondary query optimization that can actually make effective use of our processing model. And finally, we integrate all of these concepts into our um, research prototype of a query execution engine that is MorphStore, and our end-to-end -end evaluation um, showed, that, uh, showed the effectiveness and usefulness of um, our vision and our proposed concepts. So um, the works that I've presented here are based um, on these papers. You can find a couple of more papers on my DBLP. Um, we are especially um, happy that our recent VLDB um, submission um, can be revised for a yeah, further chance for acceptance. And with that, um, I conclude my talk and um, I thank you for your attention and I'm open for your questions right now. Thank you very much. Uh... Patrick, are there any questions? Yes, of course. I can't escape this one. Eh? Uh -huh. That's, of course, uh, excellent talk. Excellent talk. Thank you. Um, I have 
only two questions, but I could of course spend for another day, but I will always frame myself by only two questions. Mm -hmm. First of all, uh, you're using actually uh, generated data. Mm -hmm. And we know from experience in the past, that's the worst you can do. Mm -hmm. And I refer to actual experiments we reported in a second paper on imprints where we noticed that in reality, data does not actually exhibit homogeneous access patterns in the data at all. Mm -hmm. So that actually makes A, the compression choice difficult, and B, the subsequent uh, finding the best optimal compression in whatever dimensions uh, using model extremely difficult. So what is your reaction on that one? So I would say that uh, in our experimental survey, um, we considered a lot of different data characteristics. So um, of course the data was generated, but um, at least we used different data distributions, different run lengths, different amounts of outliers. So we hope that we can at least uh, capture a lot of things that could also happen in practice. So um, here's a very typical example of columns we found. Uh, columns actually with had a nicely sorted behavior for let's say a few hundred elements and then a piece of purely random stuff mm -hmm. and that was not uncommon to be found mm -hmm. so that's just one example <clears throat> so i refer you back to actually the original paper that uh, life out there in the data world is not as homogeneous as we would like to have mm -hmm. for, for practice mm -hmm. okay but that's you're done with your phd so you don't have to do it uh, the second question I have, and that's in, indeed relates to what you're proposing there, is to compress and decompress on the fly. Mm -hmm. I played around with that one about seven years ago in, uh, in MonoDB. Mm -hmm. There were a few conclusions. Well, except for that the, 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 it was pretty costly at that time. It uh, only takes a 50, uh, 50 lines optimizer to plug in actually the compression, decompression into a MonoDB plan. And then you can experiment uh, with that uh, structure in the complete environment. So mm -hmm. A, do you have a library which I just can plug in? And B, then I will give you the 50 lines of code to see how it would affect actually the Monet global processing. Um, regarding library, do you mean the uh, library of compression algorithms or for the process? If you can compress an array, and decompress an array, mm -hmm. I can plug it in actually overnight. Okay. Um, so we had the implementations that we use in MorphStore are open source on GitHub. And the question is in how far um, um, they depend on the other implementations in most well, of them. To give you a little example, if you to look at big plants, mm -hmm. then there are two interesting points. Many of the intermediates you create are immediately consumed in a subsequent pro, uh, operator. Mm -hmm. That's an area where you should not compress and decompress to start with. And you can detect them. The second part is that you know that in big plants, typically, intermediates are being produced and then kept in memory because they have to wait to other uh, operators becomes available mm -hmm. so there's a big time gap and that's an area where you may actually decompress to it uh, compress to the remove the footprint to decompress later on mm -hmm. so there are actually a few very easy ways to uh, a reduce the cost uh, the cost of compression decompression mm -hmm. uh, in a very well-defined environment so I would have been curious to see how far you would have come to that area. Mm -hmm. I mean, for the memory footprint, I absolutely agree. But regarding the runtime for intermediates that are um, immediately consumed again, um, that's, I mean, in, in that respect, our processing model is actually quite close to MoneyDB. And we even uh, reuse the plans um, out of MoneyDB. And uh, even there, we could um, observe performance improvements because um, if we don't materialize the uncompressed data in between, um, but compress it, it was beneficial in the end. So, but I, I would say that as long as we don't pipeline the data directly into the next operator, um, as far as I, as far as we've seen, it should still be beneficial also for performance. Okay, if need, we can take it offline further. Let's give others an opportunity to, uh, to, to challenge you. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, I have a question as well. Uh, hi, Patrick. Uh, thanks for your talk. Very good talk. Thank you. Uh, so I have a question regarding your processing model mm -hmm. uh, because you basically rely on a column at a time processing model, right? Mm -hmm. So you basically consider that you're going to apply the same compression scheme for the whole column. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you had like, uh, like Martin has mentioned sometimes uh, data changes in the same mm -hmm. at the same column. Mm -hmm. So Imagine if you have like two different uh, compression schemes mm -hmm. for the same column. Would your approach be able to handle this case? Um, the problem at this point on challenge is that we have to determine at runtime which scheme to use. Yeah. And um, we haven't implemented this so far, but um, I mean, one could in theory extend uh, existing algorithms or you could have a a wrapper algorithm, let's say, that um, does not only decide a bit width, for instance, to use for a block, but also decides to which um, to which algorithm to forward this block, for instance. But this would at least this would uh, incur a certain um, overhead in mm -hmm. runtime. Um, so we did not we did not try that. And in addition to that, um, um, Another problem that I see here is that it might decrease the performance, um, for instance, due to instruction cache misses. Um, if you have to apply different kinds of decompression um, steps in between. So let me briefly go back to the slide. Um, oh yeah, this, this one. Mm -hmm. So, um, boop, boop, boop. yeah, as I said, we execute basically the decompression routine and recompression routines. And if these change again and again, then this might not be beneficial for instruction cache locality. So um, this is, I would say, at least a challenge here. Um, but we haven't conducted experiments like this, so I cannot tell if it still pays off then. OK, thanks. That would be a, an interesting thing to investigate. Yeah, yeah definitely. Mm -hmm. But um, again, as, as I said, and, uh, and also again um, regarding uh, Martin Kersten's um, comment, um, most lightweight integer compression algorithms already adapt to the data somehow um, by defining blocks on their own and selecting a bit width or selecting a reference value, for instance. And so at least to a certain degree, the approach as we have it here um, can also adapt to local variations in the data characteristics. But um, the only thing we cannot do so far is, for instance, to use runnings encoding for one part of the column and then data encoding plus nice compression for the other part of the column, for instance. I see. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, hi, hello, this is Jenny. Uh, I, I actually have uh, two questions uh, if I have the time to ask. Uh, anyway, the first, uh, first one is related to this uh, uh, slide and it's about uh, the, um, uh, what, what, was the, what was your term, the, the, process, um, uh, the processing um, sequence. So uh, yeah, so um, so I was just wondering, uh, do you also consider, like for instance, uh, a group um, consecutive operators into one such um, your one such of your uh, gray box uh, because it looked like that uh, uh, you add this gray box to uh, uh, decompress for the opera before uh, uh, to decompress before the operator and then of course uh, recompress after that and if you do this for every op uh, consecutive uh, operator and uh, that sounds quite expensive mm -hmm. so uh, what if you can um, put uh, well, extend this uh, gray box and uh, put all op um, uh, um, put more operators into this, uh, um, uh, you know, into this gray box so that you can uh, do the decompress and recompress uh, um, after a group of operator. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So first of all, um, as I've said, um, this decompression recompression. Um, if, if we compare that to the materialization of uncompressed data, it um, was beneficial um, regarding performance. But um, the, the idea that you have here is quite interesting, and we have already thought about that. Um, because actually, I mean, with, with our approach, we followed this full materialization of all intermediates. Um, but um, there's also this, um, as I also showed in the introduction, um, this alternative approach of avoiding intermediates by pipelining. 
And in fact, um, if we look at the internals of this operator, we can see that data is pipelined through the operator, while um, between operators we use materialization. And so we also had this idea of um, uh, including pipelining of more operations inside the sector register layer. <coughs> so for instance, we could implement an entire pipeline as Hyper would use it, yeah. or at least in, in, that, um, in that style, um, to combine multiple operators in here, that's true. And, and then we could yeah. use our approach, for instance, just for um, materializing the pipeline breakers in compressed formats. So, um, so we have already thought about that, but um, uh, we haven't investigated it in detail yet. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, by the way, forgot to mention that uh, it was a uh, very interesting, very nice um, presentation. Thank yep. you. Mm -hmm. uh, second uh, question is, uh, well, of course, every, um, all this algorithm optimization, it, uh, it comes uh, uh, with some overhead. So uh, I was uh, just to wonder uh, what's uh, like, uh, what is the ratio of your um, uh, overhead and, uh, uh, and uh, what is uh, uh, the stress, uh, the threshold of, uh, for instance, uh, um, at what extent, how big the data set should be um, before it can be beneficial, uh, before your, um, uh, uh, your optimization can be beneficial. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so um, you are pointing at the runtime of the optimization, you mean? Well, maybe both actually. So I, I was just wondering uh, in general, what, what's the overhead of your, uh, uh, of your algorithm? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, of course, the runtime is um, uh, well, uh, the most important. Mm -hmm. So, um, so far, our implementation of the cost model and the optimization set strategies um, has not been tailored for performance. So it's, in fact, it's really just implemented in Python and actually not really efficient. And um, that's why we didn't even um, evaluate the runtime of, of our um, cost models. But um, if we go back to that slide, um, where was it? This one, for instance. Um, actually, we need only a few computations for each estimation. So um, for instance, or let's take this one, ah, sorry. I meant this one. Um, so here, for instance, we calculate this dot product. So that's basically 32 multiplications, 32 additions for the dot product, then maybe a penalty and some adaptation. So actually, I think for, for, for a single estimation, um, we end up with uh, dozens, depending on the algorithm, dozens or maybe a few hundred instructions. And um, we have to do this for... Um, we have to do this for all algorithms that we want to consider. Mm -hmm. So actually, I think it's uh, regarding the number of instructions at least that we have to execute. It's not that much compared to the processing of a, of a column then in the end. Um, and also the profiles that we use um, are really small. So for instance, only 64 integers for one bit with profile. Mm -hmm. okay. so, um, while I, I cannot um, present a detailed um, investigation of the uh, runtime of this optimization approach, but at least I, I think that it's gr um, relatively simple, at least compared to um, yeah, large, um, I mean, um, to the search for the optimal plan structure, for instance. Mm. Okay. Okay. Does it answer the question? Or? Uh, yeah, no, partially, yes. Okay. Yeah. okay, thank you. I have a question, if I may. Yeah, of course. So I think there's the elephant in the room here. Um, why would you go for full materialization in the first place? Mm -hmm. Can you maybe shed some light on that? Mm -hmm. So initially, um, our idea was um, to really follow this orthogonal approach to, the, um, to those systems that use um, pipelining, because this pipelining also comes with some other disadvantages. Um, for instance, um, as I said, you have this JIT compilation at query runtime. Well, wait, 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 but that's not, that's not a disadvantage of pipelining. A vectorized engine has pipelining and doesn't compile anything. I mean, there's, I think that's a bit misleading, this, uh, this statement. Yeah, yeah, uh, you're right. I mean, I, I meant it for systems like Piper, for instance, which do the JIT compilation. But um, 
um, I mean, there are um, regarding these systems that try to avoid the materialization. They either, I, I would say, they either do this pipelining via processor, processor registers, which has the disadvantage um, that you, for instance, cannot or can hardly use SIMD instructions um, or, for instance, uh, prefetching instructions. Is which systems are those? Pardon? Which systems are those systems that do this by vector instructions and cannot use SIMD registers? So, no, no. which systems are you talking about? So actually what I want to, to refer to here is the um, relaxed operator fusion, uh, fusion, fusion paper by the Peloton guys. Okay. They basically presented that, that, is a, that it is a disadvantage of um, um, compiling query engines that use pipelining via process or registers. Yeah, okay. But the, the question from Hannes was, or the remark rather than what you said, was like there are systems, like you are talking to somebody who created Vectorize and and he created the system with Mark called uh, DuckDB, and they are vectorized query processing systems, not meaning with vectorized by the way, SIMD, but buffer, column buffer at the time query processing, who kind of are pipeline systems and avoid uh, materialization. That mm -hmm. was the remark. Yes, I, I understand that. Um, I just wanted to say that um, basically for, from, from the outset, we wanted to follow this completely different approach um, and it has turned out that even systems that try to avoid intermediates also go to a partial materialization, such as is done with a vector at a time. And um, I agree, or I, I also see the point that um, 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 this has other advantages if you don't um, materialize the entire data. But uh, I think there was also there were also some works from your group where you uh, showed that reusing uh, reusing intermediates. Um, can be beneficial if different queries share the same intermediate. I mean, we did not investigate that aspect, but it would at least be um, some idea of what could be done in that direction. Um, but in the end, um, um, I would not necessarily propose that um, we should always materialize or fully materialize all intermediates, just that we try to investigate that orthogonal direction. But I think that in the end, the best solution would um, be a hybrid approach. When, where we can have, um, where we can avoid some intermediates, where we can fully intermediate other, uh, fully materialize other intermediates and partially intermediate, uh, pa partially materialize um, certain intermediates. But and, and so why doesn't MorphStore do then the thing that you propose? Um, because MorphStore is work in progress <laughs> and um, a PhD project only has limited amount of time. But uh -huh. um, we are still, um, still working on these concepts. So there's also one PhD student at the moment um, who looks a little bit into the, or has, has had some investigations into the direction of um, combining our materialization approach with pipelining. Um, but yeah, as I said, this is still work in progress. So um, I think it would be very interesting. And it's also one of the points of future work in, in my thesis um, to combine um, our compression approaches uh, with vector at a time processing. Um, but I think here, um, this will be a little bit more challenging then, um, because um, um, with, I mean, with respect to the time processing, we only materialize data in the CPU caches usually. And so um, the memory access costs are generally lower than when we materialize full columns in main memory if they don't fit into the cache. And so the compression algorithms that we use must be even more efficient to be beneficial in the end. Um, for the entire query processing, but I do not think that this is um, altogether impossible to do. And I think that even um, a vector at a time processing could benefit um, from a compressed materialization because then you can um, accommodate more compressed data elements in the caches. So you could possibly increase your vector size in the vectorized uh, processing and uh, thereby make um, yeah, the calls to the next uh, vectorized primitives um, less frequent. Um, to, amortize, to amortize the function call overhead and so on. So actually, I think it would be interesting to combine the two approaches. Well, yeah, well, two remarks. Sorry, sorry, uh, Hannes, I'm hijacking your question. Maybe I, you should uh, handle this. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm not really convinced why you would ever want to materialize a full intermediate, but that's, that's maybe, uh, maybe that's a, a, a different discussion again. But I'm just wondering, I mean, you're, you built this morph store from scratch as far as I can tell. And I was, I would, I'm just, I'd just like to understand the, the sort of the thought process that went into deciding that full materialization was the way to go. 
it was basically, I mean, the basic idea was um, to start somewhat simple because actually integrating compression into such a, such a query execution engine in the, in the way we did it um, is already a challenging task for a column at a time processing. And mm -hmm. then taking it to vector at a time is um, a step to achieve a higher sophistication. In that point, I agree. And um, we just haven't made it to accomplish this so far. Okay. But, um, but as a comment, sorry, as a comment on what you said previously, like you said, okay, we can apply this to a vectorized engine as well. I, I have two, two thoughts on that. Well, on the one hand, yes. I mean, the natural place where you would apply uh, the compression would not be during the pipeline processing because that's exactly the point, but you would apply it certainly at the materialization points. So, but then we are talking about very often a hash table, typically, which is the pipeline breaker. And mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, you just actually heard that uh, Julian, uh, who is also on the call, is a master student who is uh, working on this very uh, topic. Interesting topic, actually, because uh, because you need to access these uh, hash tables in a random order. So that that um, yeah, that makes the uh, that makes it a bit more interesting to or challenging to to achieve compression and still uh, have fast random order access. And the other thing is, like you said, that uh, okay, you said uh, not me, but you said that you would also then think of even faster methods of compressing these vectors such that they take less. Uh, CPU cache space, mm -hmm. but I think that's irrelevant uh, ra largely this this part. But uh, because you could fit maybe a slightly more um, you know data into a cache or use slightly less cache, I think what's more important in that respect is to um, uh, make sure that in your operators you can uh, benefit from Cindy basically. Mm -hmm. yeah. And 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 in Cindy there isn't there is a compression argument, namely. The smaller your unit of data size is, the more lanes you can use to process them and the faster the processing becomes. So let's say if you would have a 64-bit integer that thanks to null suppression is actually not a 64-bit integer, but it may be a seven-bit integer, then you would be saying, oh, oh, I will develop a very, very, very fast uh, compression method to push this back into seven bits. Or I would say, ho, 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 maybe that's not so smart maybe you should choose eight bits mm -hmm. because uh, because then that is a lane you know and you can actually profit better from the simulator mm -hmm. yeah and that's actually that's actually all, all, um something i mean this this for the second point now and um, with seven bits versus eight bits something that we can also capture with our um, um estimation approach so these uh, bit with profiles and that i've shown here okay this was just a example here but in fact um, for usual bit packing with different numbers of bits, um, it has some spikes in there. And usually the form performance for eight bits, for instance, is better than for seven bits. So if we then want to optimize for compression rate, we would choose seven bits. If we would want to optimize for performance, it would usually choose the eight bits rather than. So it's something we can already capture with the, the model here. And um, regarding the first point that you've mentioned, the uh, hash tables. Um, yeah, but my argument was not necessarily that um, this was because of the efficiency of the compression, because I also understand that aligning to eight bits is sometimes better than to seven, even in compression, because of the, the, the additional speed. But the argument was, was for the actual processing phase. So maybe you, you were aggregating this stuff and it's just faster to do an aggregation on eight bit uh, lanes, like than on 16 bit lanes, or certainly than on 64 bit lanes. So um, that was the argument. Okay. So I, I, actually, if you think about it, there are different ways that you can view the compressed data. There is like the ultimate bit packed, we call it bit packed, not no suppressed, but bit packed uh, representation that you would have in storage, which we say we should use in storage, but we say we should, should not use in, um, in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the pipeline, you might have an intermediate form of compressed data that's not the full 64 bit, but something that is actually uh, amenable to processing. It's like an in-memory compressed format. Okay, so. I, see, I see the point. And I think that in, in that sense, um, this on-the-fly morphing that we also proposed could be a, a good option here. So for the data that's materialized, we use the, the format optimizing the um, compression rate, for instance, and then for the processing, 
And we have just seen uh, in, a, in a previous question that inside of such an operator, we could also encapsulate a pipeline if you want, although we haven't tried that yet. But then we could um, provide data, for instance, so maybe one could plug this in at this point. Yeah. Well, by the way, thanks for the nice uh, presentation. I did enjoy it. Thank you. So you're going to build your own complete database engine and put it out there? Department. You're building your own complete database engine and putting it out there. Um, what do you mean by putting it out there? Well, uh, of course, there's a PhD track, and there is, there is, so the PhD actor can be closed down and you do something else where you can say, okay, great. Now it's time to actually fully mature it into a product and let's compete actually with MongoDB or Weather or Hyper to have their full system out there to play with. So what is your ambition with this? Um, so first of all, Morphstar is of course not only my own work, so, but it's, um, it's a joint teamwork, of course, at our chair. And um, so it's not only my personal decision what to do with it, um, but actually the, the idea, I mean, we don't have the ambition to use it as a product, um, but currently we are extending it in several different directions. For instance, for um, um, integrating uh, multi-threading, or integrating different hardware uh, accelerators uh, like vector processors or GPUs, um, which we also want to make available through our template vector library. So that's um, to also extend it in this direction. And um, yeah, um, apart from that, we are currently exploring the other degrees of integration, so especially the specialized operators to actually integrate them. So um, um, first of all, we want to among this completers in this direction. Um, yeah, but, but what is your ambition? Well, I don't have to plan to make it into a product because I'm, I'm not... No, aware. but what do you want to do? So my, my personal ambition is uh, I would like to stay in academia. So for the rest of this year, I'm a postdoc uh, at our chair still and I'm going to write a research proposal. But... Um, Although I'm really passionate about compression and, and there are dozens of things that could still be investigated and that I would be really interested in, um, actually the idea was to shift my focus a little bit, a little bit away from compression to uh, broaden my horizon a little bit. And um, yeah, in that respect, um, um, that's a little bit the reason why I think that I personally won't um, yeah, extend the compression facilities of MOV so that much anymore in a, in a uh, midterm future. And for a uh, science career track, also start moving around. Moving around, yes. <laughs> I would welcome such a chance. <laughs> and yeah, and I uh, still wanted to say um, uh, something about Peter's uh, comment regarding hash tables and uh, different data structures actually. Um, so I'm also aware of your recent ICDE paper on optimistically compressed hash tables, which was very cool. And uh, in general, I would say that um, while in my PhD project, I have um, focused on integer sequences, um, there are actually more data structures that can be used as also one of the points of future work in my, uh, in my thesis. Um, hash tables are just one example, but there are, for instance, also bit vectors, which can be used for many um, different um, operations, operators. And yeah. um, interestingly, for all these different, uh, not only bit vectors, but also for instance, in, uh, index structures. Um, so a couple of years ago, there was a paper from our group on, um, um, how was it called, this QPPT, query processing on um, prefix trees, where the idea was that each operator outputs data as an index in a form that is suitable for the next operator. And um, so that can easily be accessed and this could I mean, for all these data structures, there are compression algorithms for hash tables, for bit vectors, for index structures, and for integer sequences as columns. And um, actually, I think this would be a really cool idea also to extend this, uh, the system that we have so far in that direction. And um, I even think that the infrastructure that we have laid so far in Morphstor, for instance, with this on-the-fly TNP compression, could also be reused for different data structures. So um, if we um, have a look at this um, diagram again, um, I mean, instead of calling a recompression routine here, we could also insert the data elements into an index structure or into a hash table, for instance. So um, I think that such different data structures could 
easily be plugged into such a system. And I think this would be a really cool, interesting research, research direction, which also um, um, yeah, goes a little bit away from, from queue compression um, by deciding which um, data structures to use for intermediate results in, in which situations, for instance. Intermediate results that, that are not in a very simple, in a very simple data structure are slow. So, um, and, and, and I would like to contest you that, like, I mean, I, I think that indeed there are all kinds of use cases for certain indexing structures, but if, we, if, we, if, the, if the scope of our conversation is analytical database processing, then, you know, they always eat the same menu. They, <laughs> they consume columns and, and, and they, they query hash tables. Um, and, and actually, querying hash tables is where most um, performance goes. You know? So, uh, they are there and unless something uh, else comes along, uh, which I don't see coming, then um, they, will, they will be there and they will be the data structure with the most impact in all analytical query process. Mm -hmm. To, to support that uh, remark, if I look at TPCH environment, then we know in MonetDBA about 45% of all the CPU cycles are spent in hash, hash probing and hash analysis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is across almost all the uh, analytical database system. Right? It's the same in the hyper, it's the same in, uh, in vectorized, and it's the same in WDB. Mm -hmm. Unless, unless you do queries with how joins, of course, and aggregations, but well, who does queries with how joins and aggregations? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something, something we, of course, also observed in the, uh, when we broke down the MobStore runtimes into um, individual operators. So at the moment, the uh, join implementation in MobStore is also hash-based, um, using our own linear probing hash table. And um, since currently we um, only use the on-the-fly DMD compression, it used in, um, uncompressed data internally, but for instance, with a specialized operator, um, we could also uh, use the same hash table um, using different, um, yeah, using, using compressed data elements. So um, I mentioned that we use this TDL, this template vector library for using vectorization. And mm -hmm. so far we have only investigated different um, vector sizes, but we also have a, a degree of freedom there for the element sizes in the vectors. And we have just had some student projects um, where we extended the, the, this um, template vector library to also support smaller elements. And we are basically about to try this also then for the, for the join, for instance, so to say that if we know that the um, um, column contains only 32-bit values or only 8-bit values, then we can also use this in that way in the hash table, which might, uh, which is in, in the end then a very simple form of compression and which might accelerate the query processing if the hash table then fits into the cache, for instance. So I think that ties that also ties in very well um, into our processing model. But of course, um, one could also use more sophisticated um, ways to compress hash tables. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are there more questions? I have lots of them uh, still, but I'll keep them for, for later. <laughs> um, just so it's in the interest of time. Maybe just one, uh, given that that slide we are just showing you is on, uh, and coming back to the very beginning of the discussion that you had with Martin about, uh, what Martin was challenging about, uh, you know, to integrate this in MonetDB. There's a fundamental difference between that and what might have been done in MonetDB so far, and that is, um, you integrate, although you know it's kind of you keep the operator internals intact in, in this uh, on the fly DMD compression. As you pointed out, there is pipelining going on from the from the compressed input through the decompression, the operation, and the compressed recompression of the output. And that pipelining, to my understanding, has never been uh, implemented in MonetDB. The approaches to do on the fly compression decompression in MonetDB would have been an extra operator around. The normal operator, which called, which called decompress the, the compressed data entirely, materializing the complete original data, then process it, and then recompress uh, the entire output into a compressed chunk. And of course, that would uh, not compare to your, or would not be able to compete with your footprint uh, experiments, uh, because you know that the footprint is uh, 
actually larger than the original to just aggregate all the intermediate results and replicate the analysis. But uh, that's so far to, you know, simply you programmed taking, it yourself. Oh, simply taking this code and putting it in MoneyDB might be a bit farther away than. Um, you did it yourself in 2012, Stefan. I didn't do anything. Yeah, that was the four-way product compression scheme to deal with all the OID lists. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 you're getting old. Oh, no, yeah, yeah, no, I, I was picking up code and trying to, to add my share, that's true. Um, good. Um, well, unless there's more questions or points to discuss, I said, I, I have a few more, but I'll take them uh, offline or take them in uh, Keep them for July 14, um, uh, and then uh, uh, we can do more uh, in the interest of time. Um, I don't hear anybody shouting for more questions. Then again, thank you very much, uh, Patrick. An excellent talk, absolutely. I can only join in all the um, praising of this one. And uh, thank you very much for sharing your work with us. Mm -hmm. uh, and thanks all for the discussions and uh, have a nice day and we'll see each other well maybe online in between otherwise on uh, July 14. Yes and I also would like to thank all of you I was very happy that so many people actually attended my talk so it was really a pleasure for me to give a talk in your group and thank you very much for all your feedback I think I can take a lot of that away and incorporate it in our future work hopefully <laughs> If not mine, then from someone else in our group. So it was really nice to give this talk with you. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank Patrick. You. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. Thank you. Best of luck with the defense. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. Good luck. Bye. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Okay. Bye-bye.